It's our pleasure to share with you Sunday service, especially want to welcome all those of you who are here with us as visitors or guests or retreatants at the Expanding Light. It's our joy to be here. The reading for today comes from Rays of the One Light, parallel passages in the Gita and the Bible. What is it to fail spiritually? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. The first passage is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25. Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins, five of them wise and five foolish. They await their bridegroom, the Christ consciousness. The wise virgins keep the oil in their lamps symbolic of their devotion, lit through the night. The foolish virgins place no oil in their lamps. These foolish ones are like the average devotee, going through the motions of outer ritual, but keeping no fire of love burning in the heart. When the bridegroom's coming is announced, the foolish virgins realize their mistake and hasten out to purchase oil. During their absence, the Christ consciousness comes and embraces those who have been awaiting him with devotion. The foolish ones, by their lackluster devotion, are not accepted by him. Watch, therefore, Jesus told his listeners, for you, know not, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. In Autobiography of a Yogi, Paramahansa Yogananda describes the foolish virgin consciousness he encountered in the Mahamandal hermitage he stayed in as a young man in Benares. I was pleased, he wrote, that my new home possessed an attic where I managed to spend the dawn and morning hours. The ashram members, knowing little of meditation practices, thought I should employ my whole time in organizational duties. They gave me praise for my afternoon work in their office. Don't try to catch God too soon. This ridicule ridicule accompanied one of my early departures toward the attic. Later, during meditation, I felt lifted as though bodily to a sphere uncircumscribed. Thy master cometh today. A divine womanly voice came from everywhere and nowhere. This supernal experience was pierced by a shout from a definite locale. A young priest nicknamed Habu was calling me from the downstairs kitchen. Makunda, enough of meditations. You are needed for an errand. The Divine Mother's words were not spoken for the benefit of that priest, the foolish virgin, but for Makunda, the wise virgin. For this was the day his guru, Sri Yukteswar, came to him. Grieve not, friends, if you feel that you have been foolish. No error is forever. Someday, if you keep your lamp lit now, your opportunity will come. In the Bhagavad Gita, the sixth chapter, Krishna promises every every devotee, Arjuna, none who works for self-redemption will ever meet an evil destiny. Spiritual failure, though a deep disappointment, is always temporary. Eternal hellfire is but a projection of vindictiveness in the human mind. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind.
and from Whispers for Eternity. These are prayer demands by Yogananda. A prayer demand for devotion. O Father, I hold my heart in my folded hands. Teach me to saturate my prayers with thy love. Give me the simple, sincere devotion toward thee of a child. Teach me to realize thee just behind the voice of my prayer. Teach me to feel thy breath flowing with my breath. Teach me to cognize thy presence in my emotions. Teach me to perceive thy wisdom in my understanding. Teach me to sense thy all-pervading life in my life. Oh, flood my senses with thy light. So the the reading today, we have an interesting juxtaposition of two passages. One in the Bible is really a warning to us as devotees. But then in the other one, the Bhagavad Gita, there's a symbol, there's a passage of great hope. So we'll we'll look at the warning first. (laughs) And uh, this passage from the Bible about the ten virgins is a, it's often quoted by Christians about the second coming of Christ. But Yogananda taught that really isn't, didn't have anything to do with what he was talking about. What he was really talking about, he was really addressing devotees. And the ten virgins don't represent all of mankind because after all, they were there. They did show up. They each had their lamps ready. They were ready to, uh, their lamps of devotion with the flame of their ardor there waiting to arrive, waiting to greet the Christ consciousness. But ten of them, or five of them, the foolish virgins, weren't quite ready. They let the oil burn low and the they ran out and they sort of fell asleep. And then when the bridegroom or the Christ consciousness was ready to come, ready to descend, to come into their consciousness, they weren't quite ready. And they had to go run out and look for some more oil and ask for something and they missed it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a something that we need to take to heart, that we need to think about. And the message is very clear, as Kriyananda says in the passage. It means don't, just enter into the rituals or the prayers or the practices in an empty way. But you have to do it with your, with your own heart. Keep that lamp burning. Keep that oil and the lamp of your heart and your devotion full because you have to actually reach for that. that re, you have to have that receptivity to God's grace to come. It's not about just the ritual or the prayer. Those are things that can help us get there. But without that devotion in the heart, that opening, you won't be ready when the bridegroom comes, when the Christ consciousness comes. And it's you know, easy for us to say, oh, this, is, yeah, this clearly applies to many uh, religious faiths because they just mouth unthinkingly prayers or rituals and they do these things. And that's true, he is warning against that. But it's, it's warning all of us as well. It's, it's those of us who practice yoga as well, there's part of it. And it's it applies to Eastern religion as well as Western religion. When I was thinking about this, about the empty ritual or empty chanting, I thought about the, the Hare Krishna movement. And the Hare Krishnas, for those of you, probably all remember this, but uh, it was a, a movement that was started in the 60s by a very sincere Swami, Swami Bhaktivedanta, or called Prabhupada by his followers. And he, taught, he came in the Vaishnava tradition of India, and he said, you know, chanting the Lord's name with devotion, Chanting the Maha Mantra, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna. That's all you need. All you need is that devotion, and that will bring you to God. Well, he took all comers. He accepted anyone who would come, and pretty soon they were all chanting Hari Rama, Hari Krishna in the airports, in the streets, and all around. And they had a great following. Many, many people came, and many, many people were touched by that. But they also attracted people who were still had anger in their heart and greed and selfishness and organizational things got in the way. And, you know, like many religious movements, it sort of didn't quite reach to its highest potential. And it was because there wasn't that, they didn't really awaken that devotion. They didn't keep that lamp lit in their hearts that they really needed to to receive that. Because it is, it is a truly viable tradition. The Vaishnava tradition in India is one that dates way back. And one of the primary saints of that tradition was a, a man called Chaitanya who lived in many, many centuries ago in India. 
And Yogananda, in one of his Precepta lessons, talks about Chaitanya. And it was very interesting to tune into Yogananda's perception of Chaitanya versus the sort of the Hare Krishna in our age perception of it. And, and in his, his Precepta lessons, he did a very, very interesting thing. He said, uh, he said I'm going to tell you the story about Chaitanya. And I am tuning in. This is Master Paramahansa Yogananda speaking. I am tuning in with my consciousness to the consciousness of Chaitanya to tell you his story, to tell you how he felt and how he proceeded. And he went on to tell this story of Chaitanya that Chaitanya said, you know, I came to India, I came to preach no sermons, I came to bring no wisdom, I just came to share the love of the divine that I felt everywhere. There was my heavenly father, I saw and I felt behind creation, and in creation I saw that love, that manifestation everywhere. I just chant, Radha, 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 Govinda, Jai. Victory to spirit, victory to nature. Spirit and nature dancing together. That's all I did was just go and chant. And I walked around the countryside and I didn't seek anybody following me. I would just chant the name and people would come and follow me. And I came once to a village and there's a washerman who was sitting there washing his clothes. And I did, Radha, 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 Govinda. And the washerman dropped his clothes and he picked up his, uh, he picked up his staff and he started following me, just chanting the name. And his wife came out of the hut with a broomstick in her hand and said, crazy man, what are you doing? Back to your washing. Why are you following that fool? And the washerman said, woman, just chant with me. Chant once. Radha, Radha, Radha Govinda. And the washer's woman's wife dropped her broomstick and followed after them. And the four gossips of the village came after us. They said, crazy woman, what are you doing following your husband and that crazy man? How can you do this? And the wife said, just chant with us. Radha, Radha, Radha Govinda. And the crazy gossip or the gossips of the village dropped their broomsticks and they followed. <laughs> and a hundred people came out to try to stop us and they followed and 200 and 300 and 500. And we just walked through the village and everyone was caught up in the same ecstasy I felt of that divine. That is the devotion that people need. That is what Chaitanya brought. That is the Vaishnava tradition, is to really see that in everything, there's just one love of our Father and the manifestation of the divine principle, the feminine aspect in creation. And just to never take God's name in vain, but when you say that name, always feel that devotion, open your heart to that. So it is a valid tradition, but the lamp has to burn inside. So what of us? Chaitanya came at a time in the lowest age, in Kali Yuga, he came to India, where consciousness and understanding was at a low ebb. And he just, his mission was to just chant the divine name and to transmit that love. Well, we have a, another avatar who has come to us, Paramahansa Yogananda, who came in the dawning, dawning uh, century of Dwapara Yuga, a new age of energy. And he brought a much more full path, the path of Raja Yoga, where every aspect of spiritual, every aspect of life could be spiritualized. Everything we could imagine, everything that we could imagine doing had a way to do it spiritually. And at the core of that was, of course, meditation, of Kriya Yoga, of the practices of bringing the energy up the spine, of cooperating with the body's energies, not just the devotional aspect. But what happens? You know, what happened to Yogananda? He toured around the country. Thousands came to see him. Thousands were inspired by his teachings, by his lessons, by his readings. He was received at the White House. He was front page news in the 1920s. And when he stopped campaigning, what happened? He and a handful of devotees went to Mount Washington in Los Angeles. And at one point they were growing tomatoes on the hillside just because there weren't very many people there. There weren't many people who could really keep that lamp burning, who could really tune in. And what about us? Well, you know, we're a little bit farther on. We have the great benefit of having Kriyananda and setting an example for us of interpreting these teachings. But, you know, how often do we say, well, you know, I'll go on a little retreat or I'll read a book or even I'll do my Kriya Yoga. You know, I'll put in my time morning and evening, you know, Kriya Yoga. You know, how often do we lose that spark. And it's the same warning to us. It's very just as easy for us to become one of the foolish virgins and forget about that lamp of devotion in our heart and mechanically do our practices. To just say, just put in our time. You know, if I read a book or if I 
go to Sunday service or this, you know, that, oh, that's enough. You know, that's okay. And yeah, you know, I'd really watch, rather watch a movie than do my Kriya practice or, you know, I don't really think that uh, I need to do it as much as he said. You know, every aspect of my spiritual life, I mean, spiritualize everything or, you know, that's, that's hard. You know, it's really hard. And it is. But how far do we get if it's just a mechanical practice? Just like the Hare Krishna is out in the airport chanting. If our Kriya doesn't have that yearning behind it, that soul receptivity, that ability to say, I am ready, come to me. It's like, Sunday service, how do we start? <clears throat> the voice of God calls us to awaken him. How will he find us when he comes? Are we awake and ready? Or are we out looking for oil? <laughs> so just, <laughs> you have to be, you have to keep that fire lit. You have to keep that going. And the pull of Maya, of the delusion of the world, it's strong. And it's even in a community, in a group of truth seekers, you can get pulled out. You can do that. So that leads us to the second part of our reading here today, which is the one of great hope, because the reality is it's not all that easy to keep that lamp burning and to keep that spirit going, to feel that devotion, to have that receptivity for God's grace when it comes. But there's a few very important things that we can hold on to here and to always remind ourselves of. One is that the desire for God once firmly implanted in the subconscious and the superconscious will always be there and it must be fulfilled. Just like any desire, the masters teach us, all desires have to be fulfilled. Once you have that desire to be on the path, once you have that desire for God, it will be fulfilled. It may be a while. It depends on you. It depends how, how that lamp is lit, how brightly it's burning. Yogananda, had, in one of his lessons, he had it great. He said, that desire is always there and it may take fruition now or it may have to wait until the devotee is in a better mood. <laughs> so <laughs> we should make sure our mood is one of right now looking for that, looking for that thing. And the, des the, the desire, once it's there, it's the only true desire that we have. All other desires in the world are bonded, are mixed in duality. Desire for name, for fame, for wealth, for power, for intellectual wisdom and intellectual understanding. All those things are tied up with duality. And part of that means that you will always have to pay the price. When there's an up, there's inevitably going to be a down. But they remind, the masters remind us, the desire for God, the search for God, it has no downside. There is no mitigating karma. There is no evil. There is no fall that you're going to take. It is a pure, it is the one and only pure desire. All the saints and all religions are the ones that tell us, this is what you're searching for. Hang on to that thought. Always remember that. Also, look at the people who are the best in all these other pursuits that are out there calling to us, that are pulling on our hearts. Look at the people who are famous. How many people of those do you know who are completely satisfied or completely happy or completely saying this was absolutely the right thing? How many people of power who had absolute power in history who could do whatever they wanted? How many of them ended up truly happy, truly saying this is the way? How many people of great wealth? How many people of great intellectual understanding have said this is it? None of them will. The only ones who say this is what you're searching for with on, without unequivocally, without a shadow of a doubt. They will be martyred. They will go to the ends of the earth to tell you this. They will brave disease and death to come back and do this again. Why? They tell you, this is what you're searching for. I have found it. I want to share that with you. No other pursuit in life will tell you that. So hold on to that thought. It's very, very important when we start losing a little bit of the oil in the lamp, said, no, this is the only thing that's going to bring me true happiness. This is what I'm searching for. In the Bhagavad Gita, numerous times, it's such a beautiful scripture because it's not, you know, sometimes in the Bible you can get a little lost in a lot of those passages and there's a vindictive God and the Jewish judging God. But in the Gita, it's just 
So many times Krishna, representing the divine, just reassures the devotee. He says, Arjuna, know this for certain. No spiritual effort is ever lost. My devotee, I will always keep in sight. Those sincere seekers I will bring to me. As it says in the readings, anyone working for redemption will never experience an evil destiny. And what we say every week in the, in the Festival of Light, know that a, even a little practice of this inward re- religion will free one from dire fears and colossal sufferings that are inherent in those cycles of birth and rebirth. So know that that is true, that is where you are going, is what you have come for, is why we are here, that practice we need. And it's, it's reassuring that you're not, you're not going to be lost. You may, you know, it may take a few incarnations for that, that seed to re-sprout again, but it's the right path. And, you know, it's taken us five to eight million lifetimes to get to the human birth, and then maybe another million lifetimes as a human. But now we know we are on the spiritual path. We know where we are trying to go. And even if we forget that for an incarnation or maybe two or maybe three, or if we have to wander a little bit, it will come back. We are near the end. Once that desire for God has been found, once the lamp in the heart has been lit, for it, even just for the first time, it will come back. It will always be there. And it's interesting that uh, Kriyananda in his commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita talks about three different ways that the, the devotee, once they're on the spiritual path, he says, there's, there's three things that can happen. He says, the first is you can start the path with great zeal and you're out there on the battlefield of life doing battle with your egoic desires and tendencies. And it, it is a battle. I mean, there's no mistake about it. The, the foes on the material side are many and it takes a lot to defeat those. So you're on the battlefield and you're fighting and then a little karmic bomb comes or a little delusion seeps in and you start thinking, well, you know, I really could have been a famous pianist. And, you know, now I have the opportunity. There's this great teacher who's come and I could study with them and I'm going to go study the piano. Of course, I'll still be a devotee, but, you know, I really feel like God is calling me to dedicate myself to this or some other material desire sort of blows in and guess what happens? Eventually, the devotee leaves the path. He leaves the battlefield. That's the first thing, how one can fail spiritually. What happens to that person? Well, depends how strong that desire might have been. It might be that the next incarnation will come back to it, but it might be two or three incarnations wandering in delusion of being a pianist or a famous person or something like that before that spark, before that lamp is relit, that opening comes again. So the second way to fail is, is when, uh, Kriyananda put it as you sort of die on the battlefield. So you, you're on the battlefield, you're fighting the good fight, you're a devotee, you start with great zeal and great effort in the spiritual life, and then, you know, gradually you get a little bit of peace and you get a little bit of good feelings, a little bit of joy, and, and you, as you get toward the end of your life or you get a little bit older, your energy wanes and you don't put quite as much effort into your practices and, you know, you're still on the path and you haven't gone way off, but you're there and it's, it's kind of going down to a low ebb and you're just kind of coasting a little bit. You're, you're riding the ray, as Happy Winningham used to say, <laughs> that you're not really putting out that effort. You're not really keeping that lamp lit in your heart. And he says, what happens with that, devotee? He says, well, at the end of life, what could happen at that point is it could go a number of different ways, but often at that point, the devotee starts thinking about what might have been. Oh, you know, I remember when I was a child or when I was first out of college and I was working with these people or I was doing this or wasn't that wonderful, that relationship I had and if only I could have found the right spouse or the, you know, the right, if I had better kids or if I had, (laughs) (laughs) if I could have, you know, I could have had a better life I do these. Those material desires at the end of life can start sneaking back in there. And again, they can derail the yogi. This time, probably not for a number of incarnations, but uh, Kriyananda says what could happen is you go back to the astral world and 
you're just complacent in the astral world. You know, you're, it's harmonious, it's beautiful, your soul's enjoying this peace that you've built up through a little bit of meditation, and they just hang out there for a while. And it may be hard to get back to Earth, and it may be hard to get back to that search. And, you know, eventually you're reborn again, and you have to go through infancy and childhood, and, you know, you have to reawaken that spiritual longing. So the third thing that can happen is that's the devotee who is fighting until the end. And this is, even if we don't obtain liberation in this lifetime, it's important to just keep fighting, to just keep struggling. Every time you fall, don't grieve for your foolishness. Yeah, you're a foolish virgin, but don't grieve about it. Just remember what you're trying to do, where you're trying to go, get back up again and keep going. And that is the devotee who will find the most success. And it may not be in this lifetime, but it may be in the next or right after that. When they get to the astral world, there's possibility because that sense of striving is still on the mind. There is the ability to keep progressing spiritual even in the astral world. And then there's an opportunity for a birth of a yogic family at a Nanda village. And you come right down and <laughs> you say, here I am. I'm ready to keep going right where I left off. And since there's such enlightened parents here, they immediately pick up on the child's spiritual tendency and they get them right back on the spiritual path. So that's the, that's the way to go. And there was a, there was a story uh, that some townspeople in Encinitas told to Swami. Encinitas is where Yogananda had his hermitage uh, by the seaside there that Rajasi built for him. And it, in the time in the, in the 30s and 40s, it was a sleepy little seaside town and there were fishermen there and just regular town folks. And this is a story that happened to some of the people there. There were these fishermen who were going out fishing in the ocean in Encinitas and they'd been out all day and were out of hard work and didn't really have anything to show for their catch. And Yogananda was strolling down the beach when they were bringing their boats back in and he said, oh, giving up already? And they said, yeah, it's just terrible. No luck today. And and he just looked at them and he said, why don't you go back and try once more? And he said it with such magnetism that they said, oh, okay. I mean, this, these weren't devotees, these were just fishermen. They said, okay, why don't we go try again? So they went out and they tried again. And this time they filled their nets and they got a big haul. They brought in a lot of fish and their day was worthwhile. And it's, it's, a, it's a real allegory for us too. The master is always there saying, why don't you just try one more time? You know, why don't you just try again? Go cast your net again. Yeah, you're foolish. You were foolish. You did this. But why don't you just go out there and try one more time? And, and it's interesting. Kriyananda said the lack of success doesn't have anything to do with God. It has to do with a lack of attunement to divine law on our, ta- on our part. So it's that receptivity. It's that openness in the heart. How much are we open to that success of Christ consciousness of the bridegroom coming into us. It's our lack of attunement. So by trying and trying again and trying again and trying again, we eventually get it tuned right through all our practices, through our devotion, through our longing, through our memory of all the promises that have been given to us. At some point, we will get it right. And at some point, that bridegroom will come to us. That divine consciousness will descend will be filled with that oneness, that love that's always there. It's just our own knowing that's imperfect. And at some point, for a certainty, that divine consciousness will come.
Night and day.